Welcome to Real Physics. This interview is with Abai Ashtika, a very well-known theoretical physicist dealing with loop quantum gravity that claims to be an idea of unifying gravity in quantum mechanics. He's a likable person and I agree with some of his views about fundamental constants, yet I think it's sad that he's a very seems to be very little interested in Dirac's large numbers, which I think is the only real fundamental idea about the unification of gravity in quantum mechanics. And I also think that he has some difficulties to link concepts like uh, loop quantum gravity and inflation to link these concepts to experimental evidence. Anyway, hope you enjoy watching. Uh, Professor Ashtika, um, to phrase it for a popular audience, you're dealing with fundamental physics. I would uh, like to raise the issue of fundamental constants. Uh, Einstein once said that he could not imagine that nature produces arbitrary numbers that nature could have chosen in just another way. Could you comment on this or would you agree? Um, okay, my personal point of view is that Presumably, when we have got a final theory, and then one would have some understanding of this fundamental constant from some deeper principles. But in near term, uh, it typically has not been very profitable to actually find explanations of these fundamental constants. Uh, many people, very distinguished people, have had theories about these fundamental constants, trying to explore them, to derive them from first principles, such as Eddington, for example, had, a, in fact, he called it the fundamental theory. And it really has almost, in each case, has not really ended well, in the sense that it really did not give any insights. Yeah, these yeah. fundamental theories Edding, have not worked. Eddington tried to derive the number 136 exactly. at the time from sheer logic and and then he was he was deducing one one thirty seven two, and people were mocking him for Mr. Edding one. Exactly, <laughs> Mr. Edding one. That's yeah, exactly yeah, right. That's what so you're that's what I'm referring to. Yeah. Uh, but that is one example. I mean, people have tried these ideas for many times, and it, I just don't think that we are ripe at that level, uh, at, at the current level, to address this question about the origin of the numerical values of these constants. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing is to come up with something what, which sounds really exotic, like Eddington. The other thing is, uh, do we consider this as a fundamental question? And uh, if your research is related to, so to speak, the biggest riddle of physics, the unification of gravity and quantum physics, now, uh, in this context, there is also a number that shows up, if you want to call it, the relation of the gravitational force and the electrical force in the hydrogen atom, or you might call it also the quantum force. And it's a huge number. Um, what, 10 to the 39? 10 to the 39, exactly. Um, do you think there is a, any chance to calculate this future? I don't think so. I, don't ha I haven't seen any good idea to, to that, or think that even might be a promising idea to actually calculate this number in the near future or foreseeable future. Uh, but I completely agree that any time one can explain something like this is a, is, a, is a big advance. I mean, there is, for example, in the early days of, or just before quantum mechanics, uh, one had this uh, constant called the Rydberg constant, which yes. was through the hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. And then Palmer, one... Uh, Johann Jakob Palmer actually was the... Who, who, deduced it from the experiment. Exactly, deduced from the experiment. And then the Rydberg constant, however, as soon as we had the Bohr model of atom, we could see that the Rydberg constant is completely derived from the masses of the proton, the electron, and the, the electric charge, and H-bar. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, the statement that is that... That was a revolution, that, right? that is a revolution. So, any time you can reduce the fundamental constant, the constants in terms of something, you know, uh, it, it, it is going to be a revolution. But the question about I completely agree. There are some very strange big numbers, like 10 to the, you know, uh, 10 to, to, to 39. To put it bluntly, so you would say that uh, the more we understand, the less fundamental constants we have, the more we have understood. Yes. Okay. Yes. So there has been one 
quantitative idea regarding this large number by uh, Dirac related it to the size of, to, of the universe and to the number of particles in there. Um, do you think it has any significance or? It could, but I mean, about? since Dirac himself and many other people, actually when Chandra, Chandra Shekhar had a nature article on this, um, uh, <coughs> various people have tried to, sort of, I mean, in other words, it's one thing to notice coincidences between big numbers and another thing to have even elements of a theory which okay. explains one number in terms of the other right? and the, nobody has had any success in the second. So it is true that it is important to notice coincidences because it gives people food for thought for further work uh, but I do not see any good idea at present from any circles, any any where this could be actually. Mm. Uh, coming to the present and, and the current uh, cosmological model, and referring to your mm. earlier statement that the less constants we have, the more we have understood, um, there is a considerable complication of the model with dark energy and, and dark matter. And if I understood you correctly, you see theoretical problems. Uh, do you see also methodological problems if you postulate new quantities? Does that indicate that the model might be f fundamentally flawed, like like ge uh, like uh, epicycles in, in the in medieval astronomy? Right. So let me understand. So when you say new new quantities, you are referring to uh, dark matter and dark energy. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I don't. Also bias, galaxy bias. Uh, yeah. No, I don't think so. I think this is a fact of nature. Uh, it is just like. Uh, you know, in the early days, people realized that there are so many planets and not more, not less, in the solar system. And people, of course, wanted to have some explanation for that. Uh, it's a fact of nature. that way. So, of course, in the case of solar system, it has to do with more accidental features like where the clouds, gas clouds happen to be and so on. But at the time, when people thought the solar system was a universe, it seemed like a fundamental issue, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, about the cosmology, no, I, my, my, my belief is that uh, we are learning about the phenomenological properties of uh, the cosmos. Uh, very similar again going back to our example about atomic physics, that people actually had all this atomic spectra which were, which had some separation and such thing. And some people put phenomenological order in it and that is the read book saw that it is something times 1 upon n squared and then that uh, became a constant, etc. So I think what where we are is really at a phenomenological level. I do not see any problem with methodology. Uh, but of course, in order to explain, account for this fact, we may need a kind of paradigm shift which may be needed. But I think just as Bohr's discovery of uh, the Bohr atom, which eliminated the Rydberg constant, uh, doesn't take anything away from Barmer's work about actually looking exactly. at the spectral lines. Yeah. So this is more like that. This is more like gathering the phenomenological data, but in this case, the, about the large scale structure of the universe. And I don't see that this as being, I, I feel that this is very good, that we're learning these things. And these are the beginning stages, so to say. Uh, okay, okay. So one final question, I mean, you're one of the most respected theoretical physicists and uh, certainly very busy with theory. To what extent do you, um, uh, you feel able to check the uh, result of the experiment? As for instance, there has, have been claims about uh, the discovery of, of, of gravitational waves in the very, very tiny first seconds of, of the universe. Yeah, so I mean, now that the experiments have become so, uh, so, so difficult and, and there's so much that goes into it about statistical significance as you were talking about biases in the analysis and so on, that for somebody like me it is not easy, it's not possible to really go and understand exactly what was done in every experiment. I mean, you know, maybe I can take one experiment and go in some detail but not, not any of those, all, not all the experiments. So what I do is basically try to look at something like uh, you know, the important results, important from a fundamental perspective, like that come out of Planck mission, for example, yeah. and try to understand what were the assumptions and talk to a lot of experts mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. I simulate it. But, uh, you, uh, but you're right. I mean, I think mm -hmm. I do feel that... Feeling, as a gut feeling, if this, uh, if this microwave background is taken at uh, 380 years after the Big Bang, um, 
do you think that you can seriously can derive something about the very the first 10 to the minus uh, 35 seconds from that data? Uh, no. So okay. So it's 380,000 total yeah, yeah, data, sorry, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 380,000 years. Um, no, I don't think that that's the way that science will work, right? I mean, uh, we're not going to derive something about. Uh, yeah, about what happened at the Big Bang or just soon after the Big Bang from, from this. But rather we're doing the other way around, right? We're saying that are there explanations of this? And if in fact some explanation comes up, and each explanation is going to have problems with it, I mean, uh, some merits. And then ultimately it is sort of a consensus that develops that yes, there are these problems, but on the other hand, the things you get out of these assumptions is much more than what you put into it. Now, this is a scientific but a qualitative judgment. It's, for example, like the Bohr atom. I mean, I'd, uh, again, I'd frame my favorite example, because that is very clear that, you know, one is just saying that, well, well, I'm going to assume that uh, electrons are going around in orbits, mm -hmm. just like classical Newtonian yeah, yeah. physics. Just to give the, another, another meaning to the, to the constant uh, age. Yeah, exactly. So, so to, just only, to not only photons, but also it's relevant for the atom. But that for was the, the insight, Yeah, right? but also to say that angular momentum, however, uh, is quantized. It's mm -hmm. not arbitrary angular moment is allowed. So it's an ad hoc assumption. But then how many things we got out of it is what made people believe that there is something something deep about it. But of course, the final solution, you don't have the, 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 the solar system of an atom, right? And so the final solution is quite different. So seem to me, the current ideas of inflation are like the, the Bohr atom again, in the sense that it is capturing some essential truth. Now, I don't expect it to be the final solution. I mean, I, I don't. But on the other hand, it is capturing some essential truth. And therefore, it is spurring on us to a, a, you know, a deeper path about it. So. So, thanks very much. Oh, you're very welcome.